All right, everyone, we are going live right now. I'm just going to check audios quick on the YouTube and Facebook platforms. If you're tuning in on the Bullhorn, you're going to get the heads up on this. Facebook is all good, and the YouTube stream is all good, too. So welcome back to Whitetails and Whiskey, episode number 12. Hard to believe we're at a dozen episodes now but that's where we're at with it um want to thank everyone again for all the support uh, i hope everyone out there is having a uh, a good season so far i know southern zone firearms started this past saturday so i think we're on what day five now of our firearm season here in the southern zone um running everything solo tonight nate's got stuff going on with thanksgiving and stuff coming up tomorrow um, with his family and all that stuff. So he's planning on getting ready for that because he's hosting. We're hosting here too at my house and then going for a uh, family get together as well tomorrow too. So a lot of running around, but good time, the holidays to spend with family and all that good stuff. So looking forward to that. Um, and uh, yeah, just being real thankful right now, this time of the year, uh, I was able to punch my bow tag like that we've talked about on the podcast before on a buck we call Hornet great deer not a deer i had a lot of history with he won that just showed up this year um i've been trying to look back at pictures to see if he's one that i had history with as like a year and a half or two and a half or something like that and i just haven't been able to to put any pieces together to what deer he might have been so uh other than that we got a couple bucks um that have hit the dirt um one of my neighbors was real successful and ended up taking uh uh, the number one score wise buck that we had running around this year on a uh, piece of property that I hunt, um, probably about 160 class uh, 12 pointer. So uh, the story with Mo has officially uh, been closed out and congratulations to uh, the successful hunter with that um, one shot, one kill, just like you like to see it. Um, beautiful buck. One that we had quite a bit of history with past that deer, a lot of times to get him to that age class um you know and unfortunately he was just chasing the wrong doe that morning um but it is what it is but it all works out um at the end of the day with uh with doing what we do so um thankful to have good neighbors that you know help work along with us on a lot of the properties i hunt and stuff like that um helps us have this older age class deer to chase um you know, in the areas that I hunt. So thank big thanks and shout out to the neighbors and stuff like that too, for letting a lot of those younger bucks go so we can get them into those older age classes. Um, so we can enjoy chasing the, the bucks like you see over here around the bar and stuff like that and bucks like Hornet. So uh, definitely big thanks and shout out to them and the successful people that uh, have punched their tag so far this, this gun season. So to kick it off tonight, um, we're doing uh, an Elijah Craig small batch. Uh, this comes in at 94 proof. Um, good one that I got recommended under the like $35 mark um, for a whiskey. So if it's one that, you know, you're just getting into whiskey tasting and stuff like that, I think it's a good one to get into that. Um, $35 price point is pretty nice, you know, in that ballpark for uh, a sipping whiskey. So that's what we got poured up in the little fancy glass tonight the fancy fancy tasters glass and uh got a good smell to it but not not really overpowering either not a whole lot of rye you know kind of smell that you get with like those granddad ones and stuff like that that are heavy rye mash on the bill but uh and i mean it drinks like a 94 um a lot really smooth um i don't think you get quite as much flavor as you get with some of those like 100 proofers and 100 plus proofers um i pull more flavors and stuff with those uh varietals than some of these but that 94 that's that's a really nice sipper and for an under 35 dollar bottle i would definitely recommend um somebody has that on their shelf for a nice whiskey you know without breaking the bank either um Really, really nice. Usually I don't put a whole lot into that first taste. Usually that second and third taste is where I really pick up on it, but definitely really smooth. A little bit of 
bite in the front end, but not a lot. Definitely doesn't probably have as much heavy rye as like we said, the granddads and stuff like that. Um, so if you're just looking for a nice introductory whiskey, I think this is a really good fit. Yeah, it's got some good spice, but not really a whole lot of rye punch, you know, that you might get with some of those other whiskeys that we've had on the podcast. Uh, Russ Jacobs coming in on the Facebook line. Happy Thanksgiving, Russ. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family as well. This is our Thanksgiving Eve episode um, for Whitetails and Whiskey. So um, going to be pretty short tonight because I'm sure my wife needs a little bit of help from me. Um, she's been busting her butt, getting everything ready. So again, shout out to my wife. You know, this must be the shout out show tonight just because everybody's, <clears throat> you know, working hard doing what they do and I can't do that without them. So uh, we're going to do this, you know, pretty easy down and simple tonight. Uh, with, like I said, running solo and um, I just talk some deer and drop some questions in and stuff like that. Uh, so I got a little itinerary I worked up tonight. Um for this episode to keep stuff kind of rolling. I'm not going to really shoot for that full, you know, hour and a half that we usually shoot for on the podcast. This will be nice, kind of easy going one. Uh, that way, like I said, I can help my wife get some stuff done before we have Thanksgiving here tomorrow at our house. Um, so whiskey of the night, we got that. It's Elijah Craig small batch. Um, like I said, I, for a $35 bottle, that's one I'll probably keep on the shelf um, at some point in time throughout. I think it's a good sipper. It's a good one. I think for somebody that's just getting into maybe wanting to try some whiskeys and stuff like that, I think that's a really good fit. Um, and then we added that into our infinity bottle um, that I got off of uh, Bruzel, I think is the, the page that I got the idea from um, They're on Instagram, I believe uh, he does a lot of stuff with, you know, whiskey talks and stuff like that. So I like his content over there and he had the idea for the infinity bottle on his channel, mixing his favorite whiskeys. And I thought, well, I think it'd be a good fit for the podcast for our infinity bottle. So we did add, well, I say we, I already added the Elijah Craig small batch into this too. Um, we're thinking probably around episode 20 or 25. Um, we might have a full bottle here. Um, and we're trying to figure out how we can legally give that away to a viewer. Um, so if you're interested in that or um, I've never seen something like that before. It's an infinity bottle. It's something that you kind of make your own blend of your whiskeys that you're drinking, or maybe you like to drink. Um, this one, this is all the ones that we've done on the podcast so far. So, and you got a little bit of everything in this. I had just a little thimbleful drink out of it the other day to kind of see how it was kind of blending together. And it'll change as those whiskeys continue to blend together um, from what I understand with those infinity bottles. So just a quick, I guess, rundown of the whiskeys we've done so far on the the podcast we did granddad 114 in our first episode we did turkey 101 um, and then we did two weeks of bird dog we did a bird dog apple and bird dog blackberry so you get kind of a um a fruity kind of nice taste with this uh when i tried the thimble fall out of this the other night uh sportsman's reserve from smoke and tails distillery right here in phelps famous grouse which is a scotch um that went in there and then uh we had the rare breed 116 the bullet from when Keith was on the sh uh, show. Um, the old tin cup stock is the only one that is not in the mix um, just because that bottle, you know, kind of means so much to, to us and stuff like that. You know, not that I don't want to share it with folks, but um, that's reserved only for, you know, when somebody, you know, kills on our property or something like that or in our group. Um, so that doesn't get touched very much because that's a very special and sentimental bottle to me. Um so unfortunately that one doesn't go into the infinity bottle, but we did have the rare breed 116, um, which is what the, the old 10 cup stock one is, is a rare breed. And that one's not like a 112, I think. And if you're looking for those rare breeds, I do like them more around that 112 uh, ballpark. The 116 bites a little bit harder than that. Kind of like 112. I've seen them like 113s. It's going to be all different, but depending on the batch. Um, like we said, uh, old tin cup one. And then we did the granddad bonded. That's one of my dad's staples and goes to go to's for his uh, whiskey. That one's got a lot of rye pop to it. Um, last week when Jesse was on the show, we did angels envy, which that one, they put that one in uh port cast to finish it. So you get kind of a nice fruity kind of flavor with that one too. So that mixed into this whole blend would be um, why you get a lot of, why I got a lot of fruit with that the other night when I tried to buy a thimble full out of the infinity bottle. Um, and then we added the Elijah Craig small batch into that. 
and this is what we're working with so far with the nice uh, whitetails and whiskey logo that my wife printed up on her uh, cricket machine. Um, so that's kind of cool. And Smoke and Tails uh, was generous enough to give us an empty bottle um, to be able to do our infinity bottle with this for. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, yeah, looking to looking forward to how it turns out. I think I'm going to do one uh, infinity bottle. Um, maybe every episode and we'll have multiple infinity bottles, infinity batches, so to speak, as this podcast grows. Uh, my game plan with Hornet is to do a bourbon barrel uh, pedestal mount, and that's going to go right here for the podcast. So um, we're going to move Outlaw back over, um, and then we're going to have a nice bourbon barrel right here. Maybe a little bit of habitat on it. I haven't decided yet. I've been talking to my taxidermist. He's trying to come up with some ideas to make it really flow and work. And then we're going to put Hornet on top of it because he's the buck we killed um, with the first year of the podcast. So um, he'll go on the pedestal. And then I'm thinking on almost on that kind of top of that barrel, making, you know, the different uh, batches as we do these infinity bottles going forward. I think we're going to continue to do that with the podcast. And I mean, who knows what we'll end up with. I mean, obviously my whiskey shelf is growing too, which I'm not complaining about. Um, but we'll have a lot of nice infinity bottles there. Uh, with different batches and then i'll have maybe a label printed up that my wife will make or something and we'll have each infinity batch the blends that are in it on those um you know which i think is a cool thing and something that's a little bit different with this and gives us uh all these nice talking points and stuff like that and also lets us be able to give back to you know the viewers and stuff like that with it so um i know russell commented and he said put his name in the hat for that russ absolutely um, when we get closer to filling it, we'll figure out a way to do a giveaway or something like that. Um, somehow to draw it, you know, maybe we'll have a, a score contest. Who, who knows what we'll do for it. Um, but I would like to, you know, be giving away the batches, you know, every whatever it is, 20, 25 episodes, whatever it takes to, to fill one of these 750s. So, again, thank you guys enough for the, you know, I can't thank you guys enough uh, for all that you do supporting the podcast, the conversations you bring to the table, everything like that. It does mean a whole lot. And like always, this is always live Q&A questions. This is something that's a little bit different than most other podcasts. This is, we really want to have the viewers involved um, and, and being able to see and talk to and, and hear what you have questions on or what you're seeing or your stories you wanted to share, stuff like that. Um, like always, you can comment in on the YouTube, Facebook, um, and over on the Bullhorn app, you can drop into the chat or there's a call-in feature if you do have the Bullhorn app. Um, just search whitetails and whiskey um, and you'll, uh, you know, be able to uh, jump into the call. And uh, Billy called in on that a couple weeks back now um, on one of the podcasts. So that's that's something that's a cool feature with the bullhorn. And we'll see if we keep growing it with listeners on the bullhorn and have more people being able to call in uh, going forward with it. So thank you, guys. Uh, Russ says Angel's Envy is tasty. Yeah, I did enjoy the Angel's, Angel's Envy. Um, I kind of got a lot of fruit and the fruit was a little, this kind of sweetness was a little overpowering to it. Um, for my liking, I would rather kind of sip on probably the Craig. Um, I, Turkey 101 is one of my go-to favorites, uh, but this Elijah Craig small batch is another one that's pretty nice. Um, and then uh, my favorite one is the 10 cup stock, because like I said, when that one's getting busted out, it's usually when we got something hit the dirt. So um but yeah there's a lot of good ones in there there's a lot of good ones that we have yet to get to um back here we got uh, a couple other ones that been able to pick up the last you know few weeks and stuff like that in preparations that way we don't ever run out and go what are we drinking this week um we got crown royal back there which you know we might maybe do a cocktail or you know crown of coke or something like that for one of these episodes maybe we're not going to drink all straight up sip whiskeys all the time um, we got the Cooperstown one, which is a cool bottle back there. If you can see it, it's this baseball one. Uh, that one, me and my wife got up in the Adirondacks from a small liquor store up there, which we thought was kind of cool. There's a Woodford Reserve that I just picked up. That was a pretty good price the other day at a liquor store. Um, yeah, there's a couple other ones back there. Nate said something about Evan. Maybe he wants to do Evan and Coke one of these nights too, something like that. Who knows? So maybe we'll be doing some cocktails in the near future, some mixers, uh, going forward or I think he mixes sometimes with ginger ale too, um, with, uh, with some of his whiskeys. And then there's a Lexington in the back and a couple of, uh, 
Smoke and Tails, uh, Undertaker, uh, whatever ones you whatever you want to call them, their Rise Spirit and stuff like that back there. Um, so there's a few Smoke and Tails ones too that um, we'll mix in and, as well because I do like that local that local feel. Um, we also got a couple knobs up top that'll probably get mixed in at some point. There's a nine year knob. Um, there's a 15 year knob and what else is up there we got iron smoke up there yeah so we got a lot of whiskeys you know plenty plenty to keep us busy for another uh at least to finish off this infinity bottle for sure so and if you guys would like to see one feature we'd like to hear about it too uh with the whiskey of the week or whiskey of the night for the uh white tails and whiskey podcast so enough about the whiskey side of things <clears throat> let's get into kind of the nuts and bolts of it tonight so Gun season so far, uh, we've had pretty good success this year. Like I said, the neighbor was able to tag one of uh, one of our one of our target bucks, which is which is great. You know, like I said, got it done one shot, like you like to see. Um, dropped him right there, so that's even better. Makes it a lot easier on the track side of it. Um, other than that, we've had some great sits, some good encounters, um, a lot of good up and comers I've seen so far this gun season um bucks going forward a couple of the ones that i've seen um it just seemed to be like the wine bar bucks which is kind of my next string of named bucks um the wine bar the phelps triangle whatever you want to call them uh we got like uh we got dono for the wine bar i saw him open in the morning uh clipper's been around a lot clipper's been walking in front of me left and right um so hopefully he stays on the ground and these bucks stay and get a couple more years under their belt um, so we can chase them in upcoming seasons. Um, trying to think which other ones I've seen. Uh, Clooney, who is basically the clone of George that I shot in 2018. Um, he's the second George, and I just figured he kind of George George Clooney would be a good fit for for that one. So gun season so far has been good. We're waiting on uh, taking some of our does. Uh, usually invite some friends out, stuff like that, and family members. Um, to take some does late season or people that maybe aren't having that good of a season um, to be able to put some meat in their freezer. So we've been holding off on the does, which is keeping the food sources unpressured um, and keeping our impact at a minimum too going forward with that. Uh, so uh, looking forward to being able to take some in the late gun season or maybe during the muzzle loader season, primitive season or the holiday hunt season with that. So gun season has been good. Had some good high quality sets, seen a lot of nice young bucks. Um, just nothing that, you know, we're looking for, for the shooter side of things. Um, did get out and pull a couple cameras today. Uh, one of the bucks that got hit by a neighbor during archery season is alive, doing well. Um, you can see his nice scab on his back. Um, but he's pushing right through chasing does. Um, you know, he's out there doing what he does. So, uh, other than that, I haven't heard of a whole lot of deer hitting the ground. Um, other than, uh, some of my tin cup success clients have been, you know, flowing in with pictures and stories and all that stuff. And that's one of the things I enjoy most of this time of the year is hearing about client success and hearing about, you know, what's going on uh, in their woods and stuff like that. Um, some of them hitting their number one target bucks, which is, you know, cloud nine, you know, for me, um, when they can target and harvest those, you know, specific bucks that are on the top of their list. You know, I love seeing that. Um, and a uh, couple cu- couple people that have bought seed have been able to successfully harvest over the, the food plot seed. So I'll be doing more of the seed uh, sales this year with the blend. Um, might be making some little tweaks to it, but not a whole lot. Um, but definitely love seeing the old tin cup client success. And that's, you know, why I do what I do. I enjoy, you know, all the success I hear back from clients, the pictures, the stories. Like I said, I'm I got the idea of starting to fill up these cork boards that I have sitting around the house and uh, filling them up with uh, client success photos and stuff like that. It's just, it, it lets you just sit back and really enjoy it and look at the memories similar to like the infinity bottle and stuff like that. Um, and look back at all those, you know, stories and memories and people that I've worked with and stuff like that. Um, it just really brings it full circle. So, um, and then again, this, this time of the year, I do start booking in for the 2023 season for my uh, consulting and stuff like that. So if you are interested, um, I do have some openings. I'm filling up pretty quick, though. Um, I got some habitat work to do on a few clients this year. 
Um, I do have a couple, I guess, caretaker clients or whatever you want to call them as well. So that takes up a fair amount of workload. So my on-site visit schedule is a lot less than what it used to be um, because of some of those other uh, things of going back to clients and doing habitat work um, and or having some caretaker clients where, you know, I might do their you know, food plot plantings for them or their, uh, their mowings or trimming their tree stands. Um, I don't set or check tree stands because of liability reasons, uh, but trimming out stands and stuff like that is stuff that I do for clients and stuff like that as well. So, um, and all that stuff gets, you know, packed into my 2023 season as well as, you know, my stuff too, you know, so I try to balance it the best I can and also, uh, plan on doing some stuff. I know my wife's talked about maybe wanting to go on vacation this year too. So I'm trying to also plan and have everything flow around everything like that to keep the balance with everything and keep everybody happy. So if you are interested, by all means, you know, get a hold of me. We are going to continue to do the podcast. Um, and then we'll be doing habitat videos and stuff during habitat season, uh, talking about stuff like that on the YouTube channel. I have a video that, uh, was posting the night before I went on this. So it blocked up my phone and I didn't want to, you know, short out and slow down the Wi-Fi here at the house. So, um, I do have a YouTube video that is going up, uh, tonight. It'll be up tonight at some point after the podcast is over. Um, and that's talking about, uh, one of our Hughes blinds and some of the things I like about it, dislike about it, because there's always things that you would change. Um, but, uh, and there's some good tips in there for your ground blinds that not only apply to the Hughes blinds, but a lot of blinds in general, a lot of stuff I see on client parcels and stuff that, you know, should be, should be looked at and fixed if, if you can fix them. Um, to, to have the most success with your, with your hunting setups out of it. So, um, I guess with that, uh, taking questions like always, you know, what everybody else has been, you know, seeing this season, if you've been successful, we'd love to hear about it. We love hearing, you know, like I said, my client success rates, but we also like hearing our viewer success rates. Um, a lot, a lot of people are knocking down nice deer, it seems. Um, but that's, I think it's like 70 or 75% of our, um, of our harvest is in the opening weekend of gun season in New York. So it's, it's a, it's a large percentage of it is taken during that gun season for our, our harvest here in New York. So, um, which is crazy to think of, but, uh, we're day five into it. Like I said, in, uh, one of my videos today that I was shooting in the blind, um, between, uh, between deer encounters this morning and talking about how it is a three week long grind. Um, so it's really important to pace yourself on a piece of property, um, and not put a ton of pressure on it to be able to make sure that property is getting better as the season goes on. We want to get it better going into the rut. We want to have it better coming into gun season and hunting it smartly and effectively. And then that way you're not going to have issues, um, where you're pushing more deer around and doing more harm than good on your property. Like always, we want to have those properties always improving, always improving as the season's going on, you know, to the best that we can. And that's going to help you retain your success rate um, during different parts of the season, not just early season, not just during the rut, but also the, the firearm season and your late season here in New York specifically. Um, and that's all pressure and directly access related. And that's something that if you've heard me talk before, that's what I harp on all the time is access, access, access. It's everything with a piece of property. Um, the way you hunt it and everything like that doesn't matter how you lay it out um, with habitat improvements or your food plot locations and stuff like that. If it doesn't have sound access, it doesn't matter um, what steps you're taking with it uh, to do your habitat improvements or how much you're putting in improvements or how much money you're spending on improvements, poor hunter access or um, not thought out hunting strategy. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna be shooting yourself in the foot and wasting dollars and wasting time um, if you're not thinking about this stuff critically. So, uh, other than that, uh, Thanksgiving Day I know is a big. Uh, I guess it'd probably be second biggest after our opening of firearm season in this uh, area. Um, Thanksgiving Day traditions. I know a lot of people go out Thanksgiving with family, maybe before turkey and stuff like that. Um, I'm gonna try and get both sits in tomorrow, but probably won't happen with, uh, family obligations and stuff, but I'll definitely be going out in the morning. And I think, uh, dad's going to be out in the afternoon. Um, I have stuff going on in the afternoon. So, um, 
but we definitely want to, you know, keep that Thanksgiving day thing together. Hopefully dad gets, you know, is feeling good and gets up in the morning and we can go out, you know, and sit in the woods and hopefully we'll be able to knock something down. I've never shot anything on Thanksgiving. Um, I can't say that. I don't know if I've ever shot a doe on Thanksgiving. I'd have to check some of my old tags that I've kept, but I've never shot a buck on Thanksgiving. Um, I've shot a few opening weekend. I've shot a couple uh, into that December time frame uh, with uh, with a gun and stuff like that, but I've never taken a, a buck on Thanksgiving. So maybe this will be the year. Who knows? Um, but I'm going to be out tomorrow morning. I know we got a southeast wind. We got a little bit of this uh, warm front kicking around um, with, the, with the weather right now. Um, I know tomorrow it's going to be, I think, close to 50. Today was in the mid-40s, but uh, tomorrow I think it's going to touch 50, and we got a little bit of this rain coming on on Friday or Saturday, one of those two. Um, but I know the winds kind of was going north, north, northeast tonight, kind of, with my setup, and then it's going to kick around to, like, the southeast the rest of the evening into the south tomorrow. So, um plan on that south wind tomorrow you're going to have about 28 degrees here in the upper finger lakes area to start the day so we will we will get a little bit of a frost um pretty light wind though um and then it's going to jump up into 56 tomorrow so it'll be real comfortable out there um for your afternoon set it's going to be it's going to feel really warm because we're going to get a 30 degree almost uptick tomorrow so and then we got that front coming in thunderstorm possible for my area friday morning um, I'll probably be out there. I have an idea of a spot I'm going to sit. Depends on when that weather comes in. Um, it might even be a spot where I sit in the truck and let the rain finish blowing through before I get in the stand. Um, or maybe I'll jump in one of the, the blinds until, and then swap out. Cause there's a couple stands I can sit close to those blinds. Um, if I don't have to sit those blinds, I don't usually, um, uh, like to sit them, but for those early mornings like that, where I can, sit with the rain, you know, and then switch off. Um, I think that's going to be good. So you'll have a little bit of a front for Saturday morning being good. And then Sunday looks like more of a all day kind of rainer uh, in my area going into Monday. So I thought about taking Monday off, have it tentatively planned. And then we got a lot of volatility coming up, up, down, up, down, not really cold, but we do have some fronts rolling in. So if you do still have a tag in your pocket, um, I would really look at this weather coming up. Over the next 10 days, if you haven't taken any time off of work or if you want to take some time off of work um, with those fronts coming, the deer are going to be on their feet putting the feed bag on. Um, so I think it's a great time to get out there and uh, try to get a tag filled if you haven't filled one yet. Uh, the other thing I was talking to somebody this morning about <clears throat> was um, uh, they asked me if I'd been seeing any rutting activity. And there's kind of a steady flow throughout the season. Um, it's not like it was in, you know, like the first week of November when a majority of the breeding is done first week into the second week of November when most of that breeding is done. But if you look at that clock right now, you're getting really close to about that 28 day time frame that those first does that were receptive in end of October, maybe first part of November, you're getting close to that 28 day window or so where they will recycle. Um, so you'll have does come into a second estrus cycle if they weren't successfully bred during that first estrus cycle. Um, so you will see um, some bucks back out there chasing. You will have some does that just cycle later than others as well. Um, like I said, case in point, that uh, big 12-pointer that got shot, um, he was uh, chasing a doe opening day of gun season or whatnot. So uh, there are still out there. I've seen some some trailing activity um, with some does, and that's where it boils back to, like I said, that stuff I talk about with the one-year rule um, and how critical that is to hunt some of that stuff right now. Um, keeping those data points and that information with not only specific deer, but specific areas on a property or specific properties that are very good during a specific set of days historically, and you can use that historical data to find success year in and year out on on properties in certain areas. So that's another thing that I'm really looking at this time of the year is my one year data on bucks that I believe to be still alive. Um, some of them have moved into the RIP uh, folder on my face or on my Facebook, on my laptop. Um, so 
but there's still a couple of them out there that I'm going at. But the board's had a few erased off of it this year so far um, from different deer getting shot and stuff like that. So there, there's a few still out there hanging around that I hopefully are still alive and uh, would like to come you know, cross paths with before the end of season. But if I don't, I'm thankful for the season I had, and I'll be sure to put another doe or two in the freezer if I can find the freezer space for them. Um, and then get a few other uh, friends and family out there to to share in the hunt out there, uh, you know, some of the properties that we hunt to help them fill some tags and put some meat in the freezer too. So, um, you know, because that's definitely a big thing too in our, specifically on the farm that, that we have, uh, that we uh, work on really, really hard. Um, the big thing is trying to get those doe numbers in check and keep them in check. Uh, with that so with early archery it's usually doe groups five or more we take a doe out of it um didn't have any big doe groups this year um but it kind of seems to be that first bit of uh gun season now that the does are bred they'll start to you know start to congregate out of their normal family groups and get into bigger um dope dope clusters or whatever you want to call them um and they might not all specifically come out together but they'll hang together they'll loaf together and they'll kind of leave the field together and stuff like that um that's just what i've kind of seen in my observations and sometimes those does that we were taking this time of the year aren't even does that live on our property you know for the early part of the season uh, we have a lot of late season food we have a lot of good high quality uh winter brows and stuff like that on our property and we manage for that accordingly so we do attract a lot of deer like i said having that property improve as the rut goes and then as you know gun season goes having our property continually get better and hunt better um for us but that all boils back to you know having the best uh the best access and the best plan with it to uh to find that success with those property so uh let's check it out not a whole lot of buzz tonight must be i'm not that fun when nate's not here um nothing over on bullhorn uh facebook kind of quiet Got a few viewers tuning in and stuff like that. Uh, a few viewers over on uh, the YouTube page as well, but the chat over there is pretty pretty dry. But I know a lot of people are traveling right now for the holidays. A lot of people are getting ready for Thanksgiving and not tuning in tonight, but that's okay. Um, after the podcast uh, is done you know, for the night, you'll always be able to go check it out on YouTube after the fact. Um, all the episodes are over there, so if you missed an episode, you can go back. Um and all 11 episodes are over there on that, um, as well as I know Billy and Pert Near have been putting up our podcasts on their um, on their page as well. So if you want to check them out on the Pert Near side of things too. Um, yeah. But, no, I'm, I'm glad to see the podcast go. I think, it, I think it's growing. I think it's kind of steady, slowly growing. Um, a lot of familiar faces, but it seems to be every time we say that we have a lot of new people chime into the conversation in different weeks. So uh, that's something I enjoy. Like I said, having different people tune in because everybody's schedule doesn't always fit for every week. Um, we try to do our best. and I'm going to try to really do this every week, no matter if, um, you know, Nate can make it out or if we got a guest or don't have a guest or whatever it might be. Um, you know, we want to hear from you folks to see what you like. Do you like having the extra uh you know, people around there and there's Nate chiming in on the Facebook line. My phone just bedinged on it. Uh, Jason said, took two dough open a weekend waiting for the big buck now. Yeah, that's, uh, that's where Nate's been too. Nate, I forgot to give Nate a shout out. Like I said, he's not here. So I apologize, but um, Nate took two nice big does open in morning. Um, had one of those big doe conglomerates come through. Um, on a property he hunts and was able to take two big does out of that. Um, so congrats, Jason, congrats, Nate, congrats, anybody that's filled a tag so far. Um, love hearing it. Like I said, now it's just, it's waiting for those, waiting for those, those right deer to come across your path for whatever you want to harvest. So, um, that's, that's where we're at right now. Um, yeah. Nate's in the same boat. Yeah, see, Nate, you could have made it. Or I should have probably get, packed everything up and met you at the skin and shed or something. And like I said, we're only going to go for uh, maybe 45 minutes to an hour tonight is kind of what I was thinking. That way I can help my wife uh, clean up and stuff for Thanksgiving. But uh, does anybody have any, like, Thanksgiving Day traditions or 
Um, do you guys get together on Thanksgiving morning to go hunt before, you know, turkey and stuff in the afternoon? Um, you know, what are you guys seeing in the woods right now? Are you seeing some of that, you know, some of that seeking and chasing and stuff like that still trickling around here and there? Um, the other thing too, that's going to influence that, you know, some people call it like a second rut or whatever is going to be those doe fawns coming into sexual maturity when they reach about, uh, 90 pounds live weight. Um, so that's the thing in specific areas where you have, you know, good, healthy fawns, um, that were born timely and stuff like that. Once they hit about 90 pounds, they'll be sexually mature. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the benchmark is right around 90 pounds. So that's a good thing too. If you've been watching, you know, um, you know, the deer in your area long enough and you know, there's a, a good stock of doe fawns, maybe in an area, maybe that's something you start hunting, you know, this time of the year where those doe, fawn, doe fawns are. So then that way you can uh, use that to your advantage with some of these bucks that are still out there looking for that last receptive doe. Um, some of these doe fawns are going to become sexually mature too. So that's a good, a good tip. And like I said, look to where you first started seeing that chasing activity. And now that we're getting almost 28 days into it to get that secondary kind of um, estrus cycle uh, for the doe herd in your area, you could get that, you know, secondary rut activity um, that some people like to call it on that second estrus cycle from those does that weren't bred successfully during that first estrus cycle. So um, my wife chimed in and said festivities between hunts and the Bills game. That's always uh Something is uh, football on Thanksgiving. I know the Bills got a game this year on Thanksgiving versus Detroit. So they'll be, I think, back in Detroit for that game. So that's always something that a lot of people do on Thanksgiving. Um, Jason commented in. Also, I watched the video the other night and wanted to get your opinion on it. They said when bow hunting, you should aim low for when they jump the string so you hit the kill zone. I never would have thought of that. That's a good a good point. Um, usually I don't aim, I guess, low, low. Um, I kind of put it a uh, lower third and then go straight up the leg and then put it like a third of the way. Um, the other thing that I do archery is I try not to shoot deer with their head down because when their head is down, that neck works like a fulcrum. So if you think this is your shoulder blade neck, when the head's down, and then when they come alert and that head goes up, that's why you get such that jump or that drop on the shot when the deer is head down feeding or something like that. A lot of people think that'd be the perfect time when in fact it's almost the opposite because when that head writes itself, you see that drop, you know. So um, I like shooting deer when their head is up with a, with a bow or a gun because that neck and everything isn't bunched down the vitals are typically exposed better for a good lethal shot. Um, but that's definitely a good point is, you know, aiming at that lower third, right up the leg. Um, and that's where I, that's where I want to be with uh, my archery shot. And most of the times with my gunshots too, depending on obviously angle and stuff like that would change if it wasn't uh, a broadside shot, if it was quartering away or something like that. But yeah, that's uh that, that's a good tip for, for shooting, uh, aim in lower third. Um, and then, like I said, the other, the big thing I tell people is make sure that heads up, even if you got a, you know, bleed at them or, you know, what, whatever you use to stop them. I know some people whistle, um, uh, whatever it might be to try to stop them. Um, you know, to get that shot with that head upright position, because then they got to drop like this rather than all they, they write their head, that whole body drops. Um, and I think Grant Woods did a really nice video on that with an illustration of, you know, uh, the drop lines. And it was almost two to three times the drop with the head down because of that fulcrum that that, that shoulder drop creates when that head is righted from being down versus up. So uh, good comment, Jason. Absolutely. Uh, Russ said busy week for people. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's busy for a lot of people. Even though, luckily, a lot of us might get some time off from work right now, um, it seems like uh, we got a lot of other stuff going on. So that's the, the the blessing and the curse of the holidays is you get some time off, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like you stop moving. Um, so it's definitely busy, but definitely something that's 
you know, worth, worth being a part of and something I enjoy, you know, every year, you know, seeing family and stuff like that and the stuff we haven't been able to really do the last couple of years with, you know, COVID and all that crap going on with people and everything like that. So really, really, really looking forward to, to the, the Thanksgiving, you know, festivities and the food and the fellowship, uh, tomorrow, you know, no doubt. So yeah. Good comments, good conversation. I like it. I like it a lot. Missing my right hand man though. Definitely need a definitely need a co host for this podcast. And I think Nate, I think Nate's the right fit for it. Definitely. Even though he's real, real humble with it and stuff like that. Um, I definitely think he's the he's the right fit. He's the right amount of yin to the yang or whatever you want to call it. Um we hunt somewhat similar, but we hunt a lot of a lot differently in a lot of ways too. So I think that gives us a good balance with conversations and topics. And you know, we're not just over here agreeing on everything that we're talking about too. And I think that gives us a lot of give and take and a lot of good conversation. Um, and then then we bring out other questions from other people because it brings in more opinions and more conversation. And that's and that's the the best part about this podcast being live. It's not just Hey, this is what we want to talk about tonight. You know, let's do it. Um, there'll be some things that we talk about or have written out or whatever, but most of the time it's just having the conversation with the folks listening in to what they're having uh, questions on or what they're seeing in the woods or some of their stories that they're sharing with us. Um, and that's what makes it, you know, really, really enjoyable is um, giving you folks, you know, what uh, what you what you guys are interested in, you know talking about and learning about and stuff like that. And that's kind of why the podcast started was I've done these live videos, these live Q and a videos for, you know, probably five, six, seven years now or something like that. Um, and I've always enjoyed them. I've always enjoyed the conversations and now we're doing it in a podcast because people have asked about it or I've had to go back, but now having the ability to do this and, you know, put a, put a product together for you guys that you can go back and listen to, or if you're on a road trip for the holidays right now, and you know, your wife can stand you listening to it, or maybe your husband, if, you know, if you hunt and your husband doesn't hunt or whatever, um, if they can stand uh, listening to this on the, the drive, it might be something worth putting on and, you know, and listening to the conversation, a couple of guys sitting around and sipping whiskey, drinking a beer or two, and, you know, talking about whitetails, habitat, hunting and all the above. But um, I guess we can talk about a couple other things. I know the conversation is a little bit slow tonight because, uh, you know, not as many people tuning in because everybody's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, but a couple things that we got going on, we got a couple habitat pre- projects uh, planned for this year. Um, there's a lot of apple tree release on my list this year um, in specific locations. Um, on our property specifically. Um, I know, like I said, I have a lot of tin cup work um, as well this year for habitat cuttings and stuff like that, apple tree release, uh, crop tree release, and some wood lots and stuff like that. So um, I know it's going to be a busy habitat year for me in general. So there's going to be a lot of videos and a lot of tips and tricks about that going forward. Um, You know, I know it seems like it's far away and, you know, gun season just started, but you know, bow season's already gone by and before, you know, it, we'll be looking at muzzleloader season and then the holiday season, and then it'll be, it'll be all done until, you know, the next go around and habitat season and, you know, hunting work and stuff like that. But, um, I know we have a lot of apple tree release planned this year. Um, I think we're going to do some tree plantings. Uh, I got to get a hold of Blue Hill Wildlife Nursery and see if there's a good batch of tin cup persimmons coming out. Um, I think he's going to be coming back and taking some more, uh, cuttings for those. So, uh, if you are interested in a self fertile persimmon varietal, um, that's going to be offered through Blue Hill Wildlife Nurseries. Um, and uh, I'm looking to get a, a grove or two of them started in a couple of spots, uh, strategically placed, um, along travel corridors by stand locations, <clears throat> uh, and prepping those spots for those trees, uh, when they're ready. So, um, cause that's kind of the key thing is they're going to need a full, definite full sun, 
um, moderately well-drained soil, so you can't put them down in like a lowland clay ground swamp, something like that. Um, those won't really work out for you. You're going to want moderate, moderately well-drained or well-drained moist soil um, for those type trees. Um, but again, tree plantings is something we do have every year, you know, usually a couple hundred something going in somewhere, um, whether it's, you know, evergreens or cuttings. I did a lot of cutting experiment next last year. So I'll be curious to see, um, you know, when I get into that swell, how a lot of those cuttings took off this year. Um, we did dogwood, we did, um, willow and, uh, poplar cuttings trying to think of what else there was another one in there that I can't think of right off. I'll check my book. Um, but I experimented with cuttings last year and I didn't even use a root growth hormone for most of those cuttings. Um, but I do have some, and I want to do some with hormone and without hormone, uh, you know, to, to see how that works better for cuttings this upcoming season as well. So more cuttings will be going in more tree plantings. Um, some bedding work might get done in a couple pockets and spots. Um, there's a couple corridors I got to put in around a couple stand locations that I found, uh, you know, through in season scouting and stuff this year and observation data. Uh, there's a couple new stand locations. I want to do some, uh, manipulating around going forward, uh, going into this next year. Um, yeah. And then just trying not to think too much about that, even though when I'm out there in the woods, that's usually where my head drifts to is, oh man, if that that stand was over there a little bit more as I'm seeing something observation from the stand or scouting on the way out of a stand or the way into a stand for an afternoon set or something like that, seeing some fresh sign or seeing, you know, some a little bit of change in deer movement. Um, you know, looking at and the, the wheels start turning to my head about how can I make that spot better? Or is this exactly the right spot I want to be in? Or do I want to be 10 yards that way or, you know, 15 yards that way in this tree instead of that one. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff always goes into my head. I'm always trying to put little tweaks on it to make it better, constantly working to make it better. Um, you know, and telling clients and telling, you know, anybody I talk to about it, that try to keep growing with it. I mean, we all have our, you know, go-to stands, favorite stands for, you know, the right times of the year, the right times, right positions, right locations. Um, but when it boils back down to it, you know, you can't be afraid to, to change a little bit or go outside the box or make some manipulations and some changes to get better results, you know, to keep improving, to keep growing, to keep learning a piece of property. Um, because you can't figure it all out in one year. It might take a few years to get a good grasp on it with a lot of things. But um, some of the minute stuff, but you can start to look at big picture stuff and get the big picture stuff banged out in a year or two. Um, especially with working with a, you know, a client, you know, consultant type uh, relationship with a piece of property to really get that fleshed out um, before you start, especially before you start, you know, sinking money into it with habitat improvements, land clearing, um, a bunch of time invested into certain projects make sure your access works, make sure what you're doing makes sense to the way that your property flows or how it will lay out with that change. Um, don't just plant your food plot in the only open field you have on a property. That could be maybe the absolute worst place to put a food plot on a said piece of property is where um, you might already have an open field or an abandoned pasture or whatever it might be um, in some cases. So always look critically on how that lays out and how that sets up. Um, and, uh, you know, put a little bit of thought into it and, you know, do the, do the planning ahead of time. So you're not sitting there at the, the tail end of it going, man, I wish I would have thought about that a little bit more. Or I wish I would have, you know, made this other change before I did that change kind of thing. So I'm prioritizing that. And again, basing it all back around that access, because that's, that's the key thing to, to whatever you're doing on a piece of property for hunting. So, but yeah, so I'm at about, uh, 48, 50 minutes. So stick it out a little bit longer. If anybody does have any more questions and stuff like that, topics, you know, stories they want to share, anything like that. Love to hear it. Um, I haven't been pulling the trigger, so 
I would give you guys some hunting stories, but I guess it's just really a lot of, I saw this, I saw maybe this deer, saw that deer, um, and some doe movement, whatever it might be. Um, but I haven't pulled the trigger cause I haven't been, I haven't seen the right, uh, buck that I'm looking for, um, this gun season, uh, so far. So, and again, I tagged fairly early, you know, uh, for bow this year, I tagged before November. So, uh, it's been kind of a, uh, boring streak for me and Nate, you know, kind of a blessing that we tagged early, but kind of a boring streak for conversation for, for hunts. Um, I know he got out and was able to tag some deer. His wife got her first deer with a bow. Um, he was able to nag, uh, get a couple big does with his gun opening day. So <sighs> it's, uh, it's all been good, but I, I assume we're going to have some big stories, uh, going forward, I th- I have a really good feeling one of us is going to knock down a really good one. If if not gun season, I'm kind of leaning more toward that muzzleloader season. Um, we have a couple between the two of us. We have a few really really good late season uh, type properties that we hunt. Um, I have a couple. He's got a couple um, that are really really nice in the late season for that late muzzleloader or the holiday season. That's when Nate killed his big big eight pointer last year was that holiday season day after Christmas. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to going up tomorrow on Thanksgiving. Nate says tomorrow morning, LOL. I was just, just getting ready to say that. I think tomorrow morning, I got a really good feeling about it, whether I'll be able to pull the trigger or have a, a shot opportunity. I, you know, I got a really good feeling. I think I'm going to see a shooter tomorrow. I got some good one year rule. Uh, data that I'm going to roll with tomorrow morning. So, um, and we'll see the conditions look pretty good for the wind I got for where the the location I'm going to go into. I got to kind of narrow down between two stands. So um, we'll see what, uh, what one gives me the, uh, gives me the good tingle tomorrow morning. Um, And sometimes I'll start walking toward a a spot along an access and I don't even know which one I'm going to go to and I won't uh, text my wife or my parents or whoever I'm letting know where I am until I'm, you know, in the stand and everything like that, or have made my mind up on what stand I'm going to. So, um, a lot of that's, you know, feel of it. And like I said, we'll, uh, we'll see what the wind's doing and how the wind feels when I get there in the morning. I'm assuming it's going to be East Southeast as it's kicking around that compass, uh, tonight, but it's going to be pretty light too. So, um, and with the sun tomorrow, you could have a good thermal rise. So, um, like I said, I got kind of narrowed down between a wrong wind spot um, and a couple other things too. Uh, don't really want to go too deep into the timber um, in a couple spots that I can think of too, just because I might push them off onto other people. There's going to be a few more hunters in the woods out there tomorrow morning too. So I don't want to be, you know, too intrusive and whatnot. And it's pretty dry right now in the woods. So you get a lot of leaf crunch and, and disturbance. So, um, but that's where it boils back to, um, I guess this is a good tip, uh, to finish out this, uh, this kind of episode of the podcast with, this is my kind of tip of the night, uh, for you folks. Um, I've always said, uh, you know, walk like a deer, walk like a turkey, talk like a turkey when you're in the woods. Um, and anybody that's been out there long enough or had encounters with enough hunters or stuff like that, you can tell between, um, a human walking through the woods and a deer walking through the woods. Um, it's a little tough sometimes to tell between a deer and a squirrel, believe me. Um, as we've all probably fell victim to that at some point, but, uh, there's a definite, you know, kind of a heavy footed sound that you get with, um, you know, a human walking versus a deer walking versus like turkeys going through the woods or whatever it might be. Now, obviously turkeys aren't going to be in the woods going in in the morning, but that's where I use other things to my advantage with kind of my cadence on how I walk or how I walk with my feet. Um, I, there's two different kind of methods I use when I'm walking with uh, my feet in the morning. Um, obviously I'm not trying to break big sticks, even though if you hear a deer walking through the woods, if they break a stick, they keep going. Um, it's not like, you know, you break a stick and you kind of go, oh crap. And you kind of stop. That's the exact opposite of what a deer would do. Most of the times they're most of the time just, you know, rolling right along with it. Um, 
So that that cadence that I kind of um, want to talk about that I use is I'll um, step fairly hard with my heel and then toe. Um, and what that gives is that like that two legged step that you get with a deer. Um, the other one that I like to do for a cadence, depending on, um, is I'll walk on my toes. Now this one, you're going to feel it in your shins and your calves and stuff like that. Um, and if you're not using these muscles or if you're not, you know, going between these two type of methods, um, and you have a long walk to your stand, um, you could get real burnt out with, you know, some muscles that you're not used to using. Um, but the other one that I like to do is, um, step with my toe and then drag my foot back as I put my heel down, um, or scuff my toe forward and then put my heel down and same kind of thing. You get that same kind of slide step, you know, kind of that off cadence that you would get with a four legged animal versus a two legged animal, like a human, just going, ch -ch 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 -ch. you get that ch -ch 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 -ch. like those feet are going because deer's feet are obviously going in opposites and somewhat unison most of the time. Um, and then the other thing that I like to do when I'm walking in is um, obviously, like I said, not when I break a stick, but if I'm walking, maybe I'll walk, 30 40 seconds and i'll pause for four five six ten seconds before i go again um because if you ever see a deer walk through the woods that's what they're doing and they're not necessarily stopping to observe their surroundings maybe they're stopping to grab a bite to eat on a, a maple si a sapling coming up or um you know some old field habitat or some browse as they're going along um you know so and a lot of times doing that you can walk right up on deer or get to your stand location and get up in your stand. And then once they break hits, you look over and you got deer bedded within, you know, I've got on stand and had deer bedded within 40, 50 yards of me um, because I was able to slink in on them and they had no idea I was there. Um, so that's kind of the the final, I guess, tip of the night as we close in on this hour is, you know, walk like a deer, walk like a turkey, talk like a turkey. Same thing, only different in afternoon sits when I'm going back into timber sometimes. Um, I'll carry a mouth call with me turkey mouth call and i'll make a ton of noise going through the woods like a big old flock of turkeys woods wood and um i'll stop i'll scratch around in the leaves with my feet um and everything like that and um you know same thing i've came right up on deer before and had you know very minimal uh negative reactions from them doing those uh those type of uh approaches when i'm hunting um, and most of the time I try to, I, I found out that when you're trying to be really, really quiet with how you're walking or trying to be real stealthy with it, the more noise you're going to make or the more unnatural it's going to sound, the best thing to do is try to mimic what is out there in the woods and what's in nature. Um, same thing, only different, you know, I've slid my feet along the ground before to sound like a big raccoon coming through the woods. Um, and I think it helps, you know, get back into some of those spots where, if you were, you know, two legged, you know, human walking into those spots, it sounds very foreign. It doesn't sound very natural. Um, but a lot of times I've got to the bottom of my stand and can hear deer already starting to walk toward my stand or um, just get up on the stand and get clipped into my harness. And uh, then I got deer right on top of me already, just because it's such a natural sounding sound that it's not something that's going to alarm them. So that's my kind of final tip of the night, guys, is uh, is walk like a deer, walk like a turkey, talk like a turkey um, for your access and stuff like that. And um, keep those negative uh, impacts on the deer um, that you're hunting to the best of your ability and having the best access that you can um, to help you be successful and critically thinking about that, too. So and don't be afraid to switch gears this time of the year. Um, if you're seeing some hot signer activities, maybe it's time to, you know, get a hanging hunt set up or like Nate said, sit on the ground in a hedgerow, um, or if on a little knoll in a woodlot, something like that. If you got the good intel and the good activity and the right location that you can get in and out of that sets up with the property, hunt it. Doesn't matter if it's not a tree stand or not your favorite stand. Um, you can find success, you know, thinking outside the box a little bit. And um, that might be that little bit out of the box you need to punch that tag. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. I know we went a little bit shorter than normal. 
Um, but we do have Thanksgiving tomorrow, and I know everybody's really, really busy this week and everything, but uh, I hope you do find some time to get out there in the woods this week, um, spend some time with your friends and family, and enjoy that time of fellowship and, and gathering and you know the food and the festivities. Um, and again, if you can get out in the woods, enjoy that wood time, that time in the woods. And, um, you know, like I said, that's, that's some of my favorite time in life is that, that quiet time in the woods and that, that getting to be, you know, kind of back one with nature and all that stuff. So, um, and I hope that you guys find some of that too. And like always, thank you folks for tuning in. Uh, really, really appreciate this. Um, all the support, all the, you know, the, the, the feedback, the comments, the support, the questions, and we'll figure out what we're doing for the infinity bottle, um, for a giveaway. Um, so keep that in mind for anybody out there. If you have anything you want to see featured on this podcast for a whiskey to try or a topic, like always drop it in the comments, or if you want to shoot it into us via message, um, you can do that too. We do have a Facebook page, uh, white tails and whiskey podcast um if you want to search that on facebook and drop a like in the future we'll be moving uh the youtube live or sorry the facebook live version of that over to that page specifically um and then sharing it to like our personal pages etc um but we want to get that over on the the podcast page that way that's all white tails of whiskey content over there on that and we put the youtube links from past episodes on that sh- on that page as well for uh for people to catch back up with so thank you guys so much for all the support uh really do appreciate it and um yeah good luck the rest of the season be safe shoot straight and like i said guys the meaning of the season is to be thankful so find that time to be thankful and you have a lot of things in life to be thankful for um absolutely so Thank you all for tuning in. I'm thankful for you folks. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful being able to get out and enjoy the woods and to bring this podcast to you folks and uh, catch y'all next time. 